You're listening to Season 9 of Bionic Planet, Episode 107, the much-anticipated follow-up to the untold story of the voluntary carbon market, which was Episode 100. If you've been patiently waiting or impatiently prodding for this episode, thank you for both your patience and your prodding. We began a lot earlier than I said I would, namely in the 1620s, in the Flemish village of Vilfort, now a suburb of Brussels, where a prosperous physician named Jean-Baptiste van Helmont is about to plant a five-pound baby willow tree in a 200-pound pot of soil. This simple act will trigger a 400-year sequence of events that will fuel the Industrial Revolution, push Earth's ecosystems beyond their ability to sustain our civilization, and plant the seeds of our eventual salvation. Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. There's a group of us now who are proposing that the Earth has actually entered a new epoch, and that is the Anthropocene. Anthropocene. We know that the enemy is carbon, and we know it's ugly face. We should put a big fat price on it, and of course, add to that, drop the subsidies. Earth, we broke it, we own it. And nothing is as it was. Not the trees, not the seas, not the forests, farms, or fields. And not the global economy that depends on all of these. But we can restore it, make it better, greener, more resilient, more sustainable. But how? Technology? Geoengineering? Are we doomed to live on a bionic planet? Or is nature herself the answer? That's the question we address in every episode of Bionic Planet, a podcast of the Anthropocene, the new epoch defined by man's impact on Earth. And today we address it from the perspective of the scientific revolution, which many consider to be the dawn of the Anthropocene, although some put that at the emergence of agriculture 10,000 years earlier. When I launched these history pieces in May, I planned to start with the First World Climate Conference in 1979 and then bring you up to the present through the voices of the economists, ecologists, and foresters who got us from there to here, and a few little asides to fill in the early history. Two things got in the way. First, as I dug back into the stuff I thought we'd all forgotten from high school, I realized how much we, or at least I, hadn't learned at all at least in terms of the personalities in this voyage of discovery. So the little asides got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was too interesting to just leave out. So I just piled it all into this episode. Second, I remembered how tedious it is to build a radio documentary from dozens of short interviews, especially when you're asking people to remember stuff from decades ago. It was just taking way too long. So I jettisoned the full-on documentary approach in favor of a simple narration with just a few short interviews scattered in. And I also decided to start a lot earlier because the gap between reality and public discourse doesn't begin with Greenpeace, it doesn't begin with The Guardian, and it doesn't begin with the Heartland Institute or the Heritage Foundation. It begins with the fundamental story of discovery that got us to where we are now. I lied. I'm actually starting around 450 BC, when the Greek philosopher Empedocles formulated the theory that all matter is composed of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, the building blocks of everything. Aristotle, remember him? He came around about 50 years later, and he doesn't seem to have questioned the four element theory, but rather added to it in part by ascribing different properties to different elements. Earth was cold and dry, water was cold and wet, air was hot and wet, and fire was hot and dry. To him, these properties acted as catalysts for change when the elements were mixed in different ratios. It seems silly to us now, but it appeared to explain so much. Lightning was a blend of two hot elements, hot, dry fire, and hot, wet air. Steam was a blend of complete opposites, hot, dry fire, and cold, wet water, while caustic elements like acid were a blend of fire and some unknown ratio of other elements. The four-element theory held up for about 2,000 years, mostly because no one had ripped it apart in a systemic way. 
Then, in 1620, Sir Francis Bacon published Novum Organum Scientarum, the new instrument of science, where he rails against biases, those we're born with and those we learn, as well as dogma and, my biggest pet peeve, twisted public discourse, which is still a problem today. In fact, I argue in this series that public discourse is being actively twisted by groups like Greenpeace, The Guardian, the Heartland Institute, the Heritage Foundation, among others. Although you'll have to decide for yourself if that's the case as I roll this out. Now, Bacon wrote the book in Latin, but the 1902 translation by Joseph Davy opens thus. They who have presumed to dogmatize on nature, as on some well-investigated subject, either from self-conceit or arrogance, and in the professorial style, have inflicted the greatest injury on philosophy and learning for they have tended to stifle and interrupt inquiry exactly in proportion as they have prevailed in bringing others to their opinion, and their own activity has not counterbalanced the mischief they have occasioned by corrupting and destroying that of others. I never read that book until I started to piece this episode together, and it's a surprisingly fun read that's as relevant today as it was then. And what hit me in reading it is that, contrary to what I always thought, Bacon didn't invent the scientific method. He praised it and he structured it. He points out, for example, that mechanics and other simple folk had been finding solutions through experimentation for millennia. And he slammed the highfalutin, hoity-toity, self-described natural philosophers for turning science into a parlor game. He meticulously, and I have to reiterate entertainingly, dismantled the dogmas of the past and even ripped Aristotle for popularizing the idea that you can hammer nature into logic. He essentially tells natural philosophers to come down out of your ivory towers and act more like mechanics, observe a problem, formulate a hypothesis, and then test the hypothesis through experimentation. That's what Jean-Baptiste van Helmont was doing when he planted that five-pound willow tree in that 200-pound pot of soil. He was conducting an experiment to test the hypothesis that trees come from the ground. So he nourished the tree with only one ingredient, water, specifically rainwater or distilled water, to make sure it had no minerals in it. And after five years, he uprooted it. Then he weighed it, and he found it had grown to 169 pounds, about 30 times its original weight, not including the leaves that had fallen over all those years. The soil, on the other hand, had lost just a spoonful, about two ounces out of 200 pounds. So the tree hadn't come from the soil, and it hadn't come from minerals in the water, because there weren't any minerals in that water. Where had it come from? Von Helmont concluded that 164 pounds of wood, box, and roots arose out of water only. Was he wrong? Yes. Was his reasoning wrong, given what he knew? Not really, because he never studied high school chemistry, let alone biology. They didn't exist back then. Van Helmont was an alchemist, a group that Bacon saw as somewhere between clear-headed mechanics and fuzzy-headed ivory tower natural philosophers. The alchemists experimented, but not in a systemic way, and they wove in too much gobbledygook for his taste, but they managed to stumble across a few discoveries. The industry of the alchemists has produced some effect, by chance, however, and casualty, or from varying their experiments, as mechanics also do, and not from any regular art or theory, the theory they have imagined rather tending to disturb than to assist experiment. They were most famously obsessed with transmutation, how water becomes ice, how complex substances break down into simpler ones, and whether base metals can be turned into gold or silver. And they were always mixing things together, blending rocks with fire and acid and other stuff, and then hammering their observations into this mystic philosophy, which, as Bacon points out, is where they went wrong. They generally built on Empedocles' four-element theory, although a few challenged it. One of those to challenge it was a Swiss alchemist named Theophrastus van Hohenheim, who rechristened himself Paracelsus, from the Latin para, meaning beyond, and Celsus, from the Roman encyclopedist Aulus Cornelius Celsus. 
The name change was a bit of personal branding. Then, as now, a certain breed of academics seemed more interested in building their brand than in finding truth, although Paracelsus seemed to be going for both. He directed his alchemy more towards medicine than metallurgy. He rebelled against the Greek system of humors and elements, and he declared the existence of three primary principles, sulfur, mercury, and salt, which corresponded both to the Holy Trinity and to the components of the human being, vital spirit, soul, and body. He also tended to use the Greek term phlogistos for stuff that can burn, a term that Van Helmont also adopted and which will become more important in a few minutes. For now, we'll focus on something else that Van Helmont achieved, namely that his experiments produced something similar to, but different from, air. Van Helmont called it gas, from the chaos of Greek mythology. The chaos of Greek mythology was not the chaos of today. It wasn't the disorder and confusion of a, a family road trip, and it wasn't the exquisite order of chaos theory. It was instead the formless void from which the structured universe emerged. He called one of these gases gas sylvestre, the gas of the forest, because he first isolated it when he heated charcoal, which came from the forest. While air supported life, gas sylvestre extinguished it. While air fed flames, gas sylvestre suffocated it, Although even these verbs reflect a modern understanding of what was happening. Gas Sylvester would eventually answer the question of where that tree came from, or at least partly. But Van Helmont, despite naming it the gas of the forest, went to his grave without making that connection. He was so close, but it would take another century for the best minds of Europe to figure it out. It took them so long because they were exploring new territory. And it's taken me so long to roll this episode out because the untold story of the voluntary carbon market is so much bigger, more nuanced, and frankly, more interesting than the told story is. But it's remained untold for three reasons. First, much of the telling has come from outfits like Greenpeace and The Guardian, who seem more intent on sowing seeds of doubt and disinformation than in trying to understand, let alone explain the issues. They deny this, but you again can make up your own mind after I roll these history pieces out. Second, proponents of the voluntary carbon market have failed to communicate the uncertainties inherent in nature-based solutions and the broader mosaic of solutions in which these are embedded. By failing to mainstream the technical discussions, mostly in a misguided attempt to quote, keep it simple, they've allowed ideologues and opportunists to hijack public discourse which is why it has so dangerously diverged from legitimate debate. That's a tragedy, because legitimate debate not only exists, but must be amplified. None of this stuff is perfect, and it never will be. The third reason is one I'm trying to address in today's episode and the next one in this series. Way too many of us have simply forgotten basic chemistry and biology. Or if we remember it, we forget where it came from. The original climate science deniers, who Naomi Oreskes dubbed the merchants of doubt, managed to delay action on climate change for decades by exploiting that lack of understanding and turning the tools of honest inquiry against itself. My main tool in countering that gibberish, especially in my old blog at Forbes, was a book called The Discovery of Global Warming by retired physicist Spencer Weert, who is now a historian of science. That book focuses on the history of the understanding of climate change, beginning with the days when it was just an idea and progressing through decades of sunspots and volcanoes and other theories, each of which emerged and failed to pass scientific muster. While the concept of a man-made greenhouse gas effect not only passed those tests, but evolved as new evidence came to light. Like Bacon's book, it's a great read. And it also puts all the gibberish of the science denial machine into perspective. My next installment in this series will draw heavily on Weird's book, and I can link to a free online version that he created if you want to go deeper than I do. Now, I'm no Spencer Weird, but I hope that by creating this history of climate and biodiversity finance, I'll help to dispel the myths that dominate public discourse and begin to mainstream the real debates, 
I want to wrap these historical pieces up quickly because I've taken way too long to get them out already. I keep going down rabbit holes, and all of a sudden I've spent days reading some old book that I'll use one sentence out of. These pieces that I post, they won't be encyclopedic, but they'll give you the context you need to understand more technical discussions to come. If you like what you're hearing, and you want more and better episodes of Bionic Planet, you can help me deliver them by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash bionic planet. There you can support the show for as little as $1 per episode and with a monthly cap. If you're an ethical business looking to reach a global climate aware audience, then you should also consider becoming a sponsor of Bionic Planet by reaching out to me directly at steve at bionic planet.com. That's steve at bionic planet.com. In, in contrast to the Patreon address, which is Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash bionic planet their bionic planet has no dots or dashes one thing i need to emphasize is that i'm not here to balance negative stories with positive ones i'm here to balance half-baked simplistic gibberish with contextualized complex truth and to do so in a way that is both accessible and interesting i'm looking for sponsors who want to align their brand with an initiative that stands for accuracy accountability and progress because that's what i offer The address again is steve at bionic-planet.com. Now, back to the show. Jean-Baptiste von Helmut went to his grave without figuring out where that tree came from or what gas Sylvester was. But the process of discovery began to accelerate as Bacon's ideas went mainstream and alchemy evolved into chemistry and other sciences that eventually gave us the answers. One key figure in this evolution was Joseph Black. He started out working on a cure for kidney stones, but pivoted into experimenting with something called magnesia alba, a key ingredient in antacids, laxatives, and deodorant, among other things. When he doused magnesia alba in acid, it bubbled and crumbled and dribbled out water. He weighed the crumbles in the water and found they were lighter than the ingredients he'd mixed together. Unlike von Helmont, Black left lots of notes, which you can find in a book called The Life and Letters of Joseph Black, M.D., which is where I got a lot of this. One of those letters was to a prominent physician named William Cullen, to whom Black wrote, I mixed together some chalk and vitriolic acid. The strong effervescence produced an air or vapor which flowing out at the top of the glass extinguished a candle that stood close to it and a piece of burning paper immersed in it was put out as effectually as if it had been dipped in water. He exposed sparrows to the gas, and they died in it in 10 or 11 seconds, although they would live in it for three or four minutes when the nostrils were shut by melted suet. He called the new gas fixed air because he first found it fixed in rock, but he later found it in breweries and accumulating high above congregations in churches. He eventually realized that he was dealing with Van Helmont's gas Sylvestre, and soon dozens of people were experimenting with gases all over Europe, coming up with theories that were both contradictory and complementary. In hindsight, a lot of discoveries that had gone unrecognized for decades and even centuries were rediscovered in this period, which was a lot messier than the sequence I'm laying out here. If this episode sparks your interest, another book I can recommend is Lavoisier in the Year One by Madison Smart Bell, which helped me fill in a lot of the gaps in what happens next. First, we pivot to two Germans who came after Paracelsus and von Helmont. Their names are Johann Joachim Becher and Georg Ernst Stahl. In the 1660s, Becker said that earth, air, and water were the right ways to think about stuff, but that air and water weren't building blocks of matter, they were mediums for chemical reactions. Earth had three states, he said, a solid state, terra lapidae, a liquid state, terra fluida, and a greasy or fatty state, terra pinguis, if I remember my Latin pronunciations correctly. By this time, there was widespread agreement that fire was part of a process called combustion, and Becker said combustion was related to greasy earth, the terra pinguis. In 1703, Becker's student, Stahl, picked up on Paracelsus' use of the term phlogistos for stuff that can burn. 
He proposed that some substance was released during processes like combustion and rusting, and he named this substance phlogiston. And again, I don't know if it's phlogiston, phlogiston, or, but I'll say phlogiston. Flames and rust both seem to come from inside burning and rusting material. So this all made sense at the time, except for one thing. Some materials gained weight when you burned them. We'll loop back to that. But first, one of the biggest puzzles of the day was why, when you put a lit candle in a sealed jar, it burnt out. A clergyman named Joseph Priestley formulated the hypothesis that the air had become injured by mopping up too much phlogiston. So the phlogiston in the candle had no place to go. He put a sprig of mint into the same jar and left it there for a few days. Then he tried lighting the candle again. This time, it erupted into flame. He concluded that the mint had somehow healed the injured air, perhaps by sucking the phlogiston out of it, returning it to some form of equilibrium. He again was so close to solving the puzzle of where von Helmont's tree came from, and he was about to get closer. He used a magnifying glass to heat up reddish-brown powder called red calx in a bell jar. As it heated, the powder broke down into mercury and another gas that seemed to be the opposite of fixed air. While fixed air extinguished flames, this new stuff made them glow more brightly. While fixed air put animals to sleep or killed them, this new stuff gave them more energy. Priestley figured that this new stuff supported combustion better because it was devoid of phlogiston, so it was sucking phlogiston out faster, like in a vacuum. Thus, he named it dephlogisticated air, meaning air that had no phlogiston in it. He then inhaled some of it himself and... I fancied that my breast felt peculiarly light and easy for some time afterwards. Who can tell but that, in time, this pure air may become a fashionable article in luxury. Hitherto, only two mice and myself have had the privilege of breathing it. Priestley told a Frenchman named Antoine Lavoisier about his experiment, and Lavoisier replicated it. We twice tried the experiment of the candle. It is charming. The flame is much larger, much clearer, and much more beautiful than in common air, but without color other than that of ordinary flame. Lavoisier called it eminently breathable air, and he seems at times to have tried to usurp Priestley's discovery and those of others while working hard to solidify his own claims to discoveries, as he did in this note, which he placed in a vault for safekeeping as a sort of copyright. It has been about eight days since I have discovered that sulfur, while burning, far from losing any of its weight, acquires some on the contrary. That is to say that from one pound of sulfur, one could extract much more than one pound of vitriolic acid, the extraction done in the humidity of the air. It is the same with phosphorus. This augmentation of weight comes from a prodigious quantity of air which fixes itself during the combustion and which combines itself with the vapors. This discovery, which I have confirmed by some experiments which I regard as decisive, has made me think that what is observed in the combustion of sulfur and of phosphorus could very well take place with regard to all bodies which acquire weight by combustion and calcination. And I am persuaded that the augmentation of weight of the, of metallic chalks, holds the same cause. The experiment has completely confirmed my conjectures. I have made the reduction of litharge in closed vessels with the apparatus of Mr. Hales, and I have observed that at the moment of passage from calx to metal, there is produced disengages a considerable quantity of air and which forms at least a volume a thousand times greater than the quantity of litharge used. This discovery seems to me one of the interesting to have been made since Stahl and as it is difficult not to let slip to one's friends in conversation something which could put them on the way to the truth, I believed I should make the present deposit into the hands of Mr. Secretary of the Academy for while waiting to make my experiments public. He parted with Priestley over the phlogiston issue, arguing that air was being absorbed into the burning material. The principle which unites itself to metals during their calcination, and which increases their weight, and which constitutes them into the state of calx, 
is neither one of the constituent parts of air, nor a particular acid spread through the atmosphere. It is air itself, entire, without alteration, without decomposition. So, Lavoisier thought that his eminently breathable air was pure air and that it was a necessary component in the formation of all acids. He took the Greek word for acid, oxys, and creator, genus, to give it a name, oxygen, or acid producer. While we now know that not all acids contain oxygen, the name has remained in use. Lavoisier's shameless self-promotion meant that he's treated by many as the person who discovered oxygen, but Priestley and others did get there first. Lavoisier does seem to be the one who figured out that fire didn't come from phlogiston, and he also realized that the amount of fixed gas in the air increased as animals breathe. Back over the pond, in the Netherlands, a guy named Jan Ingenhaus picked up on Priestley's work to see how this little sprig of mint healed the injured air. And he started putting the jars and plants under water, in closets, and in sunlight. And he noticed that Priestley's effect only happened in sunlight. He looked closer at the plants and saw little bubbles in those that were exposed to sunlight and none in the dark. He also saw more bubbles in the green parts of the plant, and he published his findings in 1779 in a book entitled Experiments Upon Vegetables, Discovering the Great Power of Purifying the Common Air in the Sunshine and of Injuring It in the Shade and at Night. It is evident from these experiments that plants not only have the faculty of correcting bad air in six or ten days, as Mr. Priestley has observed, but act more rapidly since they perform this operation in a few hours. That this wonderful operation is by no means owing to the vegetation of the plant, but to the influence of the light of the sun upon the plant. And that it is more especially the effect of the parts of the plant which are of a beautiful green color. This eventually led to the discovery of photosynthesis and the realization that fixed gas was a blend of oxygen and carbon, what we now call carbon dioxide. We now know that plants breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. And when I finish the next of these historical pieces, you'll see how global warming was discovered in the 1800s, as well as the genesis of geospatial mapping. These will then set up the episodes that are focused much more on the last 50 years in the history of climate solutions, a history that has been willfully ignored, willfully ignored by Greenpeace, The Guardian, and a few other outlets. And I'll explain what that means in good time. I'll drop a few more interviews before then, and if you like the show and want more and better episodes of Bionic Planet, you can help me deliver them by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash bionic planet. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash bionic planet. Bionic Planet there is all one word, no dots or dashes. There you can support the show for as little as one dollar per episode and with a monthly cap. If you're an ethical business looking to reach a global, climate-aware audience, then you should also consider becoming a sponsor by reaching out to me directly at steve at bionic-planet.com. That's steve at bionic-planet.com. I've had plenty of sponsorship offers if I'm going to tell the quote-unquote positive side of the carbon market debate. One thing I need to emphasize is that I am not here to balance negative stories with positive ones. I'm here to balance half-baked, simplistic gibberish with contextualized, complex truth, and to do so in a way that is both accessible and interesting. Your support will help me prove that you don't have to be a sensationalist twat to make a living covering climate and biodiversity finance. Before I go, here's something interesting I learned about Joseph Black. While experimenting with fixed air, he noticed that certain chemical reactions involve changes in temperature, and he became obsessed with figuring out what happens when water becomes ice and vice versa, and why snow doesn't melt as soon as the temperature goes above freezing. Black took two buckets of H2O, but one was ice at 32 degrees and the other was water at 33 degrees. He put them in a room that was 47 degrees 
and found that the water bucket warmed up to 40 degrees in half an hour. Well, the ice bucket needed 10 hours or 20 times as long to get there, even though there was just one degree difference between the two. Black figured out that H2O absorbed much more heat right before thawing from ice into water than after thawing, and he called this latent heat. In another test, he weighed a piece of ice at 32 degrees and dropped it into water. He calculated that the heat needed to melt the entire piece of ice would heat the same amount of water by 143 degrees. In his third test, he put ice in hot water at 176 degrees. The water cooled to 32 degrees, showing that the ice absorbed a lot of heat, about 144 degrees worth. Also around this time, Black hired an instrument maker named James Watt, who was trying to fix an old broken steam engine. This is a surprise to me. I thought James Watt invented the steam engine, but that's not the case. While, while trying to fix this old broken steam engine, Watt noticed a problem. The cylinder cooled down during each piston stroke when the steam condensed, wasting a lot of heat. So he goes to Joseph Black for answers, and Black told him about the concept of latent heat. Watt then redesigned the broken steam engine and launched the Industrial Revolution. And more recently, the concept of latent heat has been used to develop heat pumps, which heat and cool our houses with minuscule amounts of energy, thereby helping us reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So, one of the men responsible for identifying carbon dioxide and natural climate solutions also helped spark the industrial revolution that has driven our living ecosystems beyond the point where they can sustain our civilization in its current form over the long haul. Another pleasant theme we'll be exploring in the coming months. Until next time, I'm Steve Zwick in Chicago. Thanks for listening. <laughs>